Lakeland Public Television presents Currents. Hello, I'm Bethany Wesley. Welcome. Tonight on Lakeland Currents, we will be highlighting the Minnesota Innovation Institute, a Bemidji-based organization that is dedicated to growing entrepreneurship, economic development, and educational opportunities in Northwest Minnesota and beyond. The Minnesota Innovation Institute, or MI2, helps build the capacity of Northern Minnesota employees and employers by developing and providing educational programs and workforce development. MI2, formed in 2013, was created by companies in Northwest Minnesota and works primarily to fill needs within the manufacturing industry by providing current and future employees with the necessary technical skills to fill quality, livable wage jobs. Joining me for tonight's program is Mary Eaton, president of the Idea Circle, and Pete Abbey, retired manager of the Potlatch Lumber Mill in Bemidji. Thanks for joining me. Thank, Thank you, you, Bethany. As we start talking about what exactly the Minnesota Innovation Institute is, let's set the stage a little bit. Pete, you've been in timber and logging now for a couple decades. Tell us a little bit about what was happening in manufacturing that you saw perhaps a concern. At the turn of the century, Frankly, it goes back that far that uh, we saw the, the escalating technology that was brought to bear in manufacturing and the, the challenge for employees to uh, acquire those skills and practice them on the job and really the concern, therefore, of, of competitiveness. And remaining competitiveness is the biggest challenge uh, to manufacturers. We not only uh, compete regionally but nationally and internationally here. Uh, in our industry and so workforce development skills the things that people do and don't do make a difference to our competitiveness and therefore our ability to invest in our mill or in our businesses and the ability to grow and create value so it's at the very root of what we do in manufacturing uh, the things that people do and so you were hearing from other likewise employers that you know perhaps there was something you could do together to help find some more skills, some more trainings? Yeah, so you know, the old way was basically to, to go out and find, to recruit and to compete mm -hmm. for those skills. I can, I can go back to 2006 going to Dunwoody okay. down in, in Minneapolis and taking uh, videos with me uh, to uh, show their 40 graduates what an exciting uh, field sawmilling is. And uh -huh. uh, many of them didn't know where Bemidji was let alone they saw the sawmill running and they go, well, that's interesting. But the point is, is that we could recruit very few of them. And I think the amazing thing at the time, I asked the, the faculty at Dunwoody, uh, you're graduating 40, how many jobs are there for these 40? And they told me 940. Wow. So this, the, the field of automation, manufacturing technology, uh, has been has been in strong demand and people are very hard to find and so there's there's a better way and we think we found that. So we often use this term that skills gap term to kind of talk kind of generally about the situation. It's not necessarily then that all your existing employees are retiring and you don't have youngers coming up as much as it was the skills. Correct. Okay. I, I think whether we talk about trades or our manufacturing skills, we saw a reduced availability of those skills okay. uh, in our society. And, and in fact, manufacturing is, has fallen a bit behind. And whether it's even here in Bemidji, I think uh, manufacturing represents 3% of the job base. Uh, we'd like to see that to be 15%. So how do you move that dial? And, it, and it's really going back to the mission of Greater Bemidji, it's, it's, it's talent development. But even more important than that, Bethany, uh, the, the, the changes in the demands of technology inside these plants uh, never stop. And so staying current with that technology, uh, whether it's incumbent workers or people that you recruit, how do you bring them up to speed so that they're comfortable with the demands of, uh, on, on their intellect and, and abilities as, as well as, again, you know, being productive, happy employees. So it's, it's been something that's been there for a while. It, it's very challenging. And uh, I think uh, MI2 was, was developed with that spirit and, and need in mind. 
So it ended up becoming kind of a project of Greater Bemidji, correct? So tell us a little bit about what exactly Greater Bemidji is and kind of what it does. And I know. So Greater Bemidji has uh, uh, been in, in, a, in uh, Bemidji now for, I think it's 27 years. It started as the Joint Economic Development Commission and has uh, been renamed under new leadership. It, it's a board of 27 folks that, that are stewards of the economic development picture and mission of Bemidji. Uh, we meet monthly and we talk about really how do we turn the dial to uh, grow prosperity and grow development of Bemidji. And, and obviously a part of that as we see is again closing not only the skills gap but, but closing the, the living wage gap that again create uh, the society and the type of community we want here in northern Minnesota and not only the, the city but the entire region because we see our mission as being regional not just uh, the Bemidji area. So Mary tell me a little bit about your background and mm -hmm. I know you are also involved with Greater Bemidji but exactly how you and the ideas circle kind of fits in here. I am a board member of the Greater Bemidji uh, Economic Development Group and uh, Pete and others uh, approached my company. I've been doing uh, training or workforce development for going on 25 years or so, a uh, lot of years in the trenches, and really working with companies to figure out you know, where they're going next, whether it's new employees or a new process or new equipment, and how, how are they gonna either upskill their current workforce or how are they gonna bring in new workers that would have the skills that they're looking for. So uh, I'm the president of the Idea Circle and uh, our company is all about organizational workforce development. So Pete and a group uh, approached and asked if we would consider looking at, you know, how do we upskill uh, some of the incumbent workforce in our region and, and then that spread to other things. Okay. So. So let's talk a little bit about what exactly then the Minnesota Innovation Institute is and how it operates. Mm -hmm. So who is it that is, you know, is it existing employees? Are they new employees? Tell me a little bit about how you're finding your client base. We have uh, companies that have incumbent workforce that they want to uh, upskill. Uh, they're very talented people, but they're facing, as Pete talked about, technology that continues to kind of go straight up. Uh, and they have to know how to deal with automation, electronics, electrical, mechanical kinds of things. Uh, in addition to that, one of the things that the company started asking for too is could we create a pool? You know, are there, uh, you know, as Pete was talking about in the old days, we had the talent. You know, we had a vocational uh, skill base. Uh, we aren't producing that anymore. We need to bring awareness to the idea that these are very good, solid kinds of jobs and uh, people are highly skilled. So now it's a matter of growing the talent. You know, So they may hire someone who has um, all the work aptitude and attendance and those kinds of things but may not have the skills. So we're creating uh, probably three pipelines, the incumbents, the entry level are what we call the emerging worker, and then some high schoolers. The idea of reaching into the high school as well. Whenever you see your materials or you've heard about MI2, something that's repeated often is that it's private-led, private-driven. Mm -hmm. And that's because of that investment of the, the employers, the manufacturers mm -hmm. themselves. How important is it that they have a voice in this process? Very, and maybe I'd let Pete speak to that. Well, I think, uh, first of all, I'll back up a little bit in that uh, it is private-led, private-driven, primarily to cre you, you keep something moving and relevant by listening to your customers. And so whether it be students or employers, what do you need and how do we deliver that? And that's part of the innovation part. I, I need to back up and say a lot of credit is due uh, to uh, Dick Hansen, the president of, of BSU, when I went to visit uh, Dick in February of 2013 and said, uh, you know, President Hansen, uh, Bemidji State University is one of two center for excellent manufacturing excellence in the state, the other being Mankato, and we need help. And he inquired as to what kind of help we needed, and he wasn't sure uh, how to deliver that help but after uh, uh, probably a year or, or 
at least nine months of trying to figure out how we get this done. Uh, that's when Mary entered the scene uh, based on her ability, uh, proven ability to help uh, to deliver on, on customized training. But the, so I, I want to emphasize, although private-led, private-driven is important from, again, being relevant to your customers, the people that ultimately pay the bills, this is a partnership between Greater Bemidji, the, man, the manufacturers and the business people, the region, Bemidji State University and Northwest Tech. Okay. And that's when, many, that's when, frankly, Bemidji and Greater Bemidji shine is when we collaborate and cooperate to create something truly, truly uh, precedent setting. This is very unique. Have you heard of anything similar? Any, any, okay. No. Okay. In Detroit, maybe in California. Okay. You know, a couple spots, but nothing in Minnesota. I bet there's a lot of people watching now. Are they watching what you're doing now? Yes, I bet they are. There are, <laughs> and, uh, and we haven't found anyone that doesn't think it's a good idea and it's worth supporting, which is even more important. So you said that BSU and NTC um, were certainly enthusiastic and excited about trying to figure out a way to make this happen. How exactly are the classes and such delivered? How, what is their exact role in this? Well, Northwest Tech and through President Hansen, um, one of his gives to the project was space okay. and equipment. So uh, the Blandon Foundation, the Bremer Foundation, the Department of Employment and Economic Development all contributed to helping create that space and create the equipment that the people do their skills training on. We are actually located at, at Northwest Technical College in two of their labs. Okay. And so our training all occurs out at Northwest Tech. And we're working hard for that collaboration and hope to see that partnership even improve. How many students, how many clients have you had or, you know, people go through the program? Since 2013, about 700. Okay. Uh, we have uh, probably 25 or 30 percent have been incumbent workforce, okay. maybe 40 percent. And then the other 60 percent are either entry level or emerging. Okay. And they've taken you asked about how we deliver, and uh, it's one of the things, and Pete, Pete's here to hold us accountable, but uh, one of the things that we really pride ourselves on at working at the speed of business. Okay. And one of that, one of that, or one aspect of that is we have to be uh, flexible, so we have to be accountable and act flexibly. We have to be cost effective, and we have to be timely. So we really, we really do work at that in the way we deliver. So some of our training is occurs online, okay. so people can access it 24/7 from any location. Okay. They also come into labs at the technical college and do their skill work. So we can be very flexible for those that need that flexibility. For other agencies that maybe want to see the work hardening and the attendance, we can be very structured. Okay. So we really have that full spectrum of ability as far as how we set up our courses. So how do you reach out to somebody who, let's talk for example, those who want to change careers. I think one thing that mm -hmm. I've read is, you know, you're, somebody's tending bar and decides, you know what, this might not be a long-term solution for me and my family. Mm -hmm. How do they hear about MI2 or, you know, do the temp agencies or different places? I mean, are you reaching out? How, how do you right. help direct? We have partnerships with uh, all three of the temp agencies okay. in the community. Uh, in addition to that, we've worked with rural uh, Minnesota SEP, the Concentrated Employment Program. We also have relationships with um, vendors, you know, that might, and word of mouth is a big thing. You know, oftentimes we'll get someone who comes in because their brother did this or their sister-in-law did this. And we also get a fair number of referrals from our companies. Okay. They'll have people come in and say, I want to work here. And then they'll say, well, first you need to, you know, get skill, get, get some skills built. Mm -hmm. <laughs> then come back. Yeah. Have you found that, you know, you're incrementally getting more interest, you know, that mm -hmm. you're, each year you're finding more and more people finding? Yeah. I, the first couple years, I mean, with the incumbent workforce, uh, well, we're, we're getting deluged, you know. Okay. We, we haven't had to reach out as much as we've had to really look at what resources do we have to serve who we who we have coming at us. Um, we use the typical methods too, social media, you know, yeah. great for <laughs> Facebook, shout out. Uh, because people do hear, mm -hmm. there are many good sites where 
jobs are posted up and we'll post in those sites as well. Mm -hmm. You've touched, oh, sorry, please. Well, one of the things that uh, we, we just had our corporate board meeting, and I, one of the questions I asked Mary is, how big do you want to get? <laughs> because I think the numbers are remarkable. I'll try to share some perspectives. So again, I mentioned Deadwood, he had 40 graduates. Uh, Alex Tech, outstanding institution, had 40 graduates. Wapaton, 40 graduates. And, and we set our sights when, when we laid the mission forward, how many could we? graduate and we said 150 and and people go that's impossible well we've done that and and it's it's a different method and a different approach I also want to uh, give some credit to others are jumping on board and specifically uh, in terms of linking uh, we have Beltrami County who is is in the workforce development and again uh, closing the gap and, and has, we've just recently met before the county board talking about what role MI2 could play in doing this. So it's, it's truly, uh, we appreciate being here mm -hmm. so we can share the story because getting that word out is something that's important. And Mary has quite a list. She's, uh, she's very modest. Mm -hmm. uh, she has, uh, when I look at the number of companies that she's collaborated with over the past five years, it's truly really impressive. There's a hundred there. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, it's it's a it's it's a wide open field, and and we're really trying to again be innovative, and and what Mary says is deliver, mm -hmm. that deliver on the commitment to the student, uh, to the person that uh, the employer. Uh, I also might add that uh, credit two goes to Jim Hess and Brian Stefanich mm -hmm. at the high school, so that. One of the things as an employer is you don't necessarily want to be um, competing worldwide. You want to grow people within your community and have people that want to stay with you. And whether it's the manufacturing or even the hospital, you know, you bring talent into this community. Well, there's an incredible amount of talent here. And there's a certain number of students that really want to do things with their hands. They want to necessarily, the college route is not applicable. And we have been effective. Uh, there's a group uh, that graduated last year that called themselves the Carhartt Group. Okay. And these are 12 remarkable students. Mary got to know very well. And, and we picked one, of, uh, several businesses picked one for interns and, and actually we're employing those. They've started Mechatronics and they will finish Mechatronics. But it's really the model that we want for people that want to live in Bemidji and have a living wage and in an exciting career of manufacturing, uh, there's opportunities. And of course, we want to grow the pie. Mm -hmm. The manufacturing today, base today is not what we want it to be five years from now. We want to create those, those, that enterprise, uh, uh, a greater enterprise of manufacturers in the region. And Pete talked about um, our partners, and we definitely have partners in Northwest Technical College and Bemidji State University, uh, the high school, Bemidji High School. But our corporate partners, I couldn't say enough about those that are on our corporate council who do guide us and keep in our, in our frame mm -hmm. and focus what we need to be focused on, and that is building and growing a talented workforce. So Marvin Windows and Doors, is we reach to the border, mm -hmm. uh, Wells Technology, we've got UPM and Blandon, um, Norboard, uh, Nortec, could name many, many more. But they, they have been instrumental in keeping us focused on our mission and what they are looking for. And really, that's the end game. I mean, that's what everyone, the incumbents already are employed. But the entry and the emerging and the high schoolers are searching. Mm -hmm. They're trying to figure out, what am I going to do? And some of them come to this and find out it's not for them. And that's OK. And a lot of them come to this and think, I could do more and maybe go to the construction electrician program at Northwest Tech or HVAC or, or go to Staples and do diesel. And we like that. We want to encourage them to find their niche because that ultimately will make them happy. I do want to talk specifically about the high school program in just a few minutes here, but mm -hmm. I want, before I forget, I want to go back. You talked about how it's flexible. You know, you mm -hmm. talk a lot about the act. It was a kind of 
flexibility, cost saving, and timely. And time. Mm -hmm. How long, I know different programs can vary, but how long, if I'm in a career now and I want to change careers, approximately how long will it take me to do the program before I'm employable with the lumber mill? Ten months. Okay. And it, uh, we, we actually have a success, success story that I'll, I'll speak to. We had a, a student, a young man, that uh, was headed to Hibbing. To, he wanted to be a millwright. And uh, I offered, uh, he was an intern at Potlatch, and I said, well, how would you like to work at Potlatch and be the first graduate of Minnesota Innovation Institute? And uh, basically, he, uh, on his time, he worked, and on his time, he completed the, the uh, he was doing one uh, segment, one class a, a, a month, and there are, there are 10 of them, and he was doing the labs in the evening or when he can get away from work. And he is our, he is our evidence uh, that this works. You know, when you, the, the key is the student. You know, the, uh, it's what they do, but when the students said this, made a difference and this worked, it was valuable. Of course, the combination of going to school and working is, is, has their synergy there, right? Mm -hmm. to, to employ those skills immediately. And, and Mary and her group, you know, there was some confidence issues, uh, perhaps in terms of math abilities or what have you, and the individual attention they gave this young man to make him feel that truly he could do it and it was in AC, uh, uh, AC electronics where the math gets a little, little tricky. And he did wonderful. And so I, I, again, it's proof of what we, how we want it to go uh, and that it works. That again, it, this is, uh, it's, it's just the right combination of, of online training, lab work, work hardening uh, to, get, to get the job done. I can give you an example of Wells Technology where they'll come for a month oh, for okay. a CNC training and then we'll go and do an eight month apprenticeship at Wells. Okay. So it really depends on the person and, and the company. Mm -hmm. But in the, in the case Pete was talking about, that person worked at Potlatch. So they were paid a wage and it wasn't just a training wage. And yes, the person's give was their time to complete it but uh, also Potlatch paid for his way. So I think, I think companies are willing to invest and have shown that, and they want good workforce. And, and you know, it, you talk about an acronym or whatever, you know, to, but it really is the people. And it's unlocking that talent that is inside of them that we have to find. Mm -hmm. How is it when you're working with your employees that the opportunities of MI2 typically comes up? I mean, is it something that they usually approach you? Is it in a review situation that you're like, you know, you could benefit from X, Y, Z? How, how do right. those conversations begin? It's morphed, and I think every business is, is different. But for us, it was originally starting with the maintenance skills. So we evaluated one of the beauties of the program is you don't start everybody at zero. You, you assess their skill level. And then you say, well, this is where you're strong, this is where you're weak, and this is where we're going to start you. So we started with our maintenance group. Oh. Uh, and uh, there, I think there were 13. Now, uh, since we've, we've gone beyond that, uh, we actually open it up. And, and uh, you know, my vision on manufacturing the future is a lot of times people see these are maintenance jobs. No, these are manufacturing jobs, and I would, I would love to see what a plant of 100 Mechatronics graduates could do to create uh, you know, a plant of the future and be the most competitive plant in, in North America. Right? So I think we're, we're seeing uh, opportunities. So again, we need to provide opportunities. World-class work, workplaces train at about 2% a year, and uh, that's something we just have to do. And, MI2 is, is going to be our horse to ride. It's effective. Cool. I want to spend our last few minutes here, if we can, talking about the high school program, because mm -hmm. I know that that's been super successful. Tell me about how that's offered. Are they doing it during school? They do it on their own time? How does that really become a piece of their education? The uh, Brian Stefanich and Jennifer Volge, who is now the coordinator of the academy program, uh, recruit students. Okay. And then we interview each of okay. them and they are going to take the course as one of their hours in the day. 
Uh, oftentimes it's first hour of the day or last hour of the day. They'll do half their work at the high school, so they're doing some of their e-learning at the high school, and then they do their skills work at Northwest Tech. It usually starts in a semester where they're at the high school a lot, and toward the end of the semester we see them almost every day because they're ready to get their hands on skills and equipment and really prove that they have the skill building. Have you seen a certain perhaps type of student succeed that you know, perhaps struggles in other places? Like, do you find that this is a good fit for some of those kids that may don't have a great direction? Absolutely. I mean, we see a lot of, uh, I'm an educator, have been for 30 some years, and there is a traditional way of, of educating through uh, lecture and test, and that's a good method for a lot of people. But for some people who learn when they manipulate something with their hands, or they're very good at skill building, uh, they don't always find success. So they'll come in shoulders down, head down. I don't know that I'm gonna be very good at this. And in fact, the, one of the persons that Pete was talking about that they hired last year was one of those young men. Did not know what he was going to do, did not know what he was going to do beyond high school. Was very good working on his car. But as he, uh, as he started thinking about, I'm gonna be 18, I'm gonna graduate, what am I going to do? Came to us and the confidence, you know, when you unlock their, their own feeling of confidence, then the world is their oyster. They can do whatever they want. Awesome. Closing thought, Pete, in terms of today, is it solving the, the concerns that you had originally? Is it, is it surpassing? How yes. is it doing? Yes, MI2 has been a game, game changer. I think one of the, there's a lot of statistics on this page of paper, but 88% uh, job placement rate okay. with, with regional employers. So cost effective, timely, uh, you can do it at home and uh, there's a job at the end. Oh, that's cool. Well, I want to thank you guys both for joining me today, and I want to thank you for tuning in. Hopefully you've learned a little bit more about the Minnesota Innovation Institute and its goals. Thank you. Join me next time.